clear up to lecture 10 in our course. And what we're going to do is that we are going to finish up the chapter on the takings clause in the Fifth Amendment. So you can see that this doesn't cover a whole lot of pages. Um, this chapter, um, this chapter isn't a particularly long chapter. Um, one of the things is um, I'm teaching with this version of the book um, here, the 11th edition. Yeah, I previously um, used the 9th. Um, we kind of skipped the 10th. Um, and um, yeah, I noticed that it's kind of a smaller book. Um, I think what they did, I don't think they necessarily deleted anything. I think they just made some of the um, um, letters smaller, which, you know, I don't know why. But we have five, or, I'm sorry, four cases. I need to be able to count here. Um, you know, they go to school in Indiana, so, you know, if I want to count past 10, I have to take my shoes off. Um, but mainly what we're going to talk about is what is a public use. Um, and then we have a short section about just compensation. So uh, this is uh, the just compensation part is actually um, new um, in the book. It was not in the previous versions. I'm not sure why they added it. They didn't add a recent case. Um, maybe they just wanted to cover it finally. So public use. So, you know, whenever I teach this class in person, um, one of the things that I would do is that I would say that I would just ask the class, um, you know, can you think of some things that are clearly a public use? And I usually get, um, you know, uh, quite a few good answers. So, you know, but kind of the essence of it, you know, it's not for the benefit of one individual or private person, but for the good of society. So things like airports, highways, um, you know, public buildings, uh, schools, parks, those are pretty easy. Um, but remember, I mean, the thing is, when you do build these things, um, it can uproot people's lives. So, you know, I have a picture there of when they were building Kensington Expressway, sometimes known as 33, through the east side of Buffalo. Cuts right through a neighborhood. Um, you know, you probably notice if you're, if you drive there, you know, you're like, hmm, the houses are really close to this highway. But then there's some things that might be closer calls. So that is uh, Highmark Stadium. Um, it's not going to be there much longer. Um, it'll be there for a few more years. Um, but what about what about to build a stadium? Can you use public? Um, can you use eminent domain there? Because I mean, let's think about it. it so there are different ways that you probably have to look at that. You know, Erie County does own the stadium. Um, the Bills are not the only people that use that stadium. So there are concerts there. Um, I was thinking that Garth Brooks has been there recently. Um, very good performer. Um, you know, you have, um, I believe you have an RV show that's there. Um, I think that's where Wingfest is. Um, it's not just that the Bills play their home games there. Um, but, you know, here's one. What if it was used only for the Bills? Because the Bills are not owned by the city of Buffalo. They're owned by the Pagoulas. Is it mainly for their benefit or is it for the public benefit? But there are some things that, you know, you just sit back and go, hmm, well, I can, you know, I can, I can kind of make a, you know, A to B to C to D kind of uh, uh, looking at um, things to get calling things a public use, but, you know, it's not one that I'm just automatically saying is for public use. Um, so, again, even when it is a public use, you know, if you're taking somebody's house and demolishing it, they don't have that house anymore. You need to find a new house, unless they want to sleep in their car, which is not a good thing. Um, I mean, slept in my car. Um, I might have taken a short nap like at the rest area, um, but you know, you want somewhere to live. So some early cases, one of the things is, is that um, the court was very, very limited on what they considered a public use until you get kind of into the um, kind of post, um, um, kind of New Deal court or post, um, you know, whenever the four horsemen go away. Um, so Cola versus LaGrange, where the court said there, you know, 
you know, only for, you know, private object. So um, another restrictive meaning in Missouri Pacific Railway versus um, Nebraska. So in Cincinnati versus uh, Vester. So one of the things there is that Cincinnati um, took some property to carry out a road widening project. And um, they, uh, they actually had more than they needed. Then they were going to sell it off as surplus. The court said, you can't do that. It would be unlawful. Because, you know, here's one of the things that uh, I think when we get to Kilo that probably some of you are going to start thinking, wow, you really kind of have to stretch it to say public use. And you might be thinking that in some of the cases that we get before that. Whenever you use eminent domain or use, uh, you know, things to take property from one person and give it to another person or entity, you know, not that great. Now, as you get a more pro-government, I would say, court in X, United States X Rel Tennessee Valley Authority versus Welch, what you see is that, um, you know, one of the things that uh, was kind of big during the New Deal um, was building dams. They could generate power, and this was able to generate power for a lot of Appalachia building these dams. Um, you know, again, you know, I think we talked about this last time, is, you know, you build that, you get a lake behind it because, you know, you want the water coming out. The thing is, it, 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 it floods. All, a lot of stuff in the back, and, and you have people that may live there. So taking the land for a dam, the flooded land, was a public use. Now, there is Washington, D.C. Um, this is one where you don't actually have to use the 14th Amendment. You're probably thinking, why don't you have to use the 14th Amendment? Because Washington, D.C. is not a state. Now, if Democrats maybe could have got Joe Manchin on board, maybe they could have made it a state, but um, not a state. It is, um, it is essentially a territory. You know, Congress can do what it wants to with the territory. Now, they have given Washington, D.C. what they call home rule. They have a delegate in Congress who can vote on, vote on amendments if it's not decisive, can vote in committees. Um, but one of the things about Washington, D.C., if you've ever been there, um, you know, most people want, as tourists, kind of visit the touristy places. So, you know, you can see there's the Washington Monument looking over the mall to the U.S. Capitol. So, most people kind of uh, visit, the, you know, the monuments, maybe the Capitol, the Supreme Court, maybe the White House, and some other stuff. Um, maybe go to Ford's Theater. Um, maybe, you know, you know, a lot of a lot of folks, they're, they're probably their, their main experience in being in Washington, D.C., probably was at some time in school, they, they went on a school trip. So, you know, it probably took you a lot of different places, probably took you down Embassy Row, took over to Arlington Cemetery, which is in Virginia. Originally, it was actually part of the District of Columbia. But, you know, they tend not to take you to some of the um, parts of Washington, D.C. that are not what, what, might, what we call desirable to go to. So, like a lot of cities, you know, you had areas that we would call slums, that we had blight. So, you know, what one of the things that we see happens, and we'll talk about this when we get to chapter, when we get to the next book, when we talk about the chapter on um, on uh, remedies for discrimination, is that you know you have all these people crowd into these cities. And then eventually people want to uncrowd into the cities and go to the suburbs. And some of the people that were left tended to be um, not as well off in certain neighborhoods. Um, so Congress creates the D.C. Redevelopment Act of 1945. It was a comprehensive use plan. And you can see there on page uh, 600 and uh, um, 42. They were talking about Southwest Washington, D.C. So Washington is cut up into um, quadrants. So uh, with the capital being in the middle, so kind of, uh, you know, you, you take that north-south from the capital and the north, north capital and south capital street, and then basically the mall and east capital street. Um, there isn't much 
of Southwest compared to the others because a lot of the land was given back to Virginia. Um, so this is kind of an area um, not too far from where the Nationals play now, but it was an area that had really, um, really gotten in a bad condition. And, you know, as you can see there, um, one of the things is, is that, you know, when you have, you know, awful slums, you know, just in view of the cat in view of the capital, um, you know, there are lawmakers that probably think, you know, maybe we don't want to have um, these slums that close. So what would happen? It was, it was for health, safety, and welfare of the community. Public hearings could be held on any proposal. After this, um, this, um, this board could obtain through um, eminent domain the property to improve blight. So the title, so the deeds would go to a government agency. They would fix up the property. So basically you're going to take you're going to take dilapidated properties like some of the ones that you see there on page 642 and the government was maybe they maybe they would demolish them and build something new maybe they would try to fix them up as you can see from some of those um, you know some of them probably were maybe a little bit harder to fix up so then what would happen they would be sold or leased pursuant to this plan so um, few properties in this area were in that good a shape. So um, Morris here and and the heirs who were um, Samuel Berman and Solomon Feldman of the um, Morris estate, um, you know, they didn't like this. Um, they, they said, you know, we don't want it. Now, remember, if you if you have a public purpose and you have a taking, the government just doesn't get it for free. Remember, they do have to provide just compensation. So, so they're not getting, so they're not taking it and um, not getting any compensation for it. Um, so they objected, saying that the property would be taken from theirs and sold off to somebody else. So the district court upheld the taking in Burma versus Parker. So the question is: Is the public use under the Fifth Amendment? Remember, no Fifteenth Amendment or Fourteenth Amendment. Um, so for Burma, so for the state, they said that. You're basically taking property, turning it over to private parties. This is not a public use. So you can't basically take one person's land and sell it to another. So basically you're going from uh, party A being the owners of it to the government, I guess you would say party B, to somebody else, party C. So they said their property wasn't blighted. So remember, this was a comprehensive area. So, you know, they were kind of going in more with a blunt force. So they said, you know, we didn't get the chance to um, remodel or repair some of the areas. Even, 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 if, you, even, if, you, uh, um, even if you disagree with what we say that it was blighted, we don't think it was. But we didn't get the chance to fix it up. After the District of Columbia, um, you know, the people on this committee... They said that, you know, the fact that you're cleaning up slums and eradicating blight is a public purpose. So this is the nation's capital city. We want it to look nice. So who will own it in the future does not negate the public purpose of the legislation. And Congress concluded that you couldn't do this piecemeal. You couldn't do it parcel by parcel. You had to kind of go in and take big areas, um, do whatever the commission is going to do. You know, maybe they're going to raise some of them, um, you know, start from scratch. But that's the only way that you're going to be able to do this. You can't just do, you can't just go, you know, oh, this one, this one, this one. You know, you have to you have to go in comprehensively. Now, it's a unanimous decision by Justice Douglas, um, not eight to zero. So um, there was one justice, I think, that it maybe died. The reason it was eight to zero, or, or it resigned, or, or something. Um, I should have looked that up. Why it was not nine to zero? But um, the Fifth Amendment um, case, because Congress has the power of the District of Columbia, so you don't have to do incorporation. So the power of eminent domain is essentially means to an end. So essentially, you know. 
it's up to Congress to choose the means. So what you see here is that Justice Douglas in the court, as far as what is a public purpose, were being extremely differential. So they're kind of saying, well, Congress, if you say it's a public purpose, it's a public purpose. So the fact that what Justice Douglas is saying is um, they're agreeing completely with the District of Columbia. You can't do it piecemeal. You can't do it piece by piece, one by one by one. You, 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 have, to, you have to just go in and, you know, almost take a wrecking ball to the area to fix it up for future owners. So he said that the rights of the owners are protected by the fact that they will get just compensation. Now, a case that you get a little bit later, so there's kind of a long history of this. So, Hawaii, um, it is our nation's 50th state. Um, in fact, I will tell you, it is the only one of the 50 states I've never been to. And, you know, kind of think about this. You actually do have interstate highways in Hawaii. Why would you have those? Last time I looked, you could not drive to Hawaii. You know, unless you, unless you had a ferry, I guess you could call that a route, but... Private ownership of, of land in Hawaii was not once permitted. So, kind of what you had here is that, um, you know, it, w it was kind of um, the way it was originally settled before it ever, before they ever thought about being part of the United States was, uh, was kind of a feudalistic system. You know, you had um, you had the chief that would uh, the high chief that would distribute the stuff to lower ranking chiefs, and then um, and then you had tenant farmers and families that would um, tend to the land and work on it. So really, you just didn't really have private property. So you didn't have what you what kind of is the basis of more um, our kind of English based um, system. Now. You had this monarchy. It was overthrown in 1893. It was a brief republic. And um, then Hawaii was annexed by the United States. So some folks maybe wanted to become part of the United States. Some didn't. So for a long time, it was a territory. And there's a whole big story about how it eventually... There, there's some issues about how it ends up becoming a state. Because you just think about it in the 1950s. Hmm, who had a large sway in Congress? Segregation of Southern Democrats. Hmm. Do you really want to bring into the country this, uh, you know, majority, minority state that's pretty multi-ethnic? So, you know, had a lot of people. It met the conditions to come in the Union, but uh, again, he ends up having some compromises and it becomes part of the Union in 1959, along with Alaska. So, by the mid-1960s, the state and federal government owned about half of the land. Um, why? I mean, you just think about it. Why, how did Hawaii, how did Hawaii, how did those islands come to exist? Volcanoes. Um, so, um, you know, why the federal government owns some of the land? You know, national parks, national recreation areas, um, military bases. Um, you know, some of the land really isn't, uh, you know, if you're close to a volcano, you don't really want to live there. Um, but of what was left, 72 people held the other 47%. So just think about that. 49% the federal government has, 72 families, 72 private um, people have 47 percent. So, you just do the thing there is that, you know, you add those two things together, you know, 4 percent of the land is not owned by those folks. So, on the island of Oahu, which is where Honolulu is, 22 landowners own 72 percent of the private real estate. So, you know, that's one of those things where you just sit back and go, wow, you know, talk about a uh, 
oligarchy. So the legislature, so, um, you know, you just think about that. Those 22 people probably are pretty powerful. But if we live in a democracy, the majority of people get to vote. So, um, you know, folks were kind of, uh, folks were kind of uh, irritated. So they thought that we need to break up this, uh, this basically oligarchy. So they also wanted to encourage economic development. Yeah, they wanted to encourage development and economic development. So the, um, they, they, wanted, they wanted these folks to sell off some of this property. They didn't want to. So finally, you passed the Land Reform Act of 1967 which uh, creates the Hawaii Housing Authority. So basically, they would condemn the property, take it, um, the people, the, the owners would be compensated, and then they would sell the um, land to private individuals who had previously been leasing it. Um, so, one of the things is, is that um, compelled sales, some of the owners feared that it would cause them to have a big, bigger tax bill. Um, so, so he, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, want, Mr. Midkiff, Frank Midkiff, didn't want to lose his land. So it was given federal, um, more favorable tax status. So it loses the district court, but win at the circuit court level. So, you know, you had this whole IE housing authority, um, the power to condemn land, take it by eminent domain. So the question is, is this public use under the Fifth Amendment? So the Hawaii Housing Authority says, no, we need to look to Berman. Um, it doesn't matter if it later goes to private parties. We need to give a lot of deference to the legislature. So breaking up this land monopoly is a public use. So it's, a, and they also say that this is a really unique situation in Hawaii. So, you know, Hawaii, it, you know, it's not connected to the mainland. It's the last state to join the union. Um, it's just it's just so much different that um, you know you have to recognize how unique it is. So for Midkiff here, um, just because the legislature says it's public use doesn't mean that it makes it one. So this essentially is transferring property from one person to another, and that's really what it is. So it's basically the person is leasing it; they're going to take it and uh, give the person money and sell it to them. So they said state isn't even buying the land; they're just really acting as a middleman. So they said here it isn't even changing the land. It's literally going from uh, the the leasee to the government through the government um, that basically you're going to transfer a title to different folks. So there's uh, Frank Midkiff. So it's a unanimous decision by Justice O'Connor. So they give wide latitude to the legislative determinations. Uh, so a lot of uh, you know kind of um, you know. We're, we're going to we're going to have hands off. So the court will not substitute its judgment unless the use be palpably without reasonable foundation is what Justice O'Connor says in this case. So it needs to be reasonably related to conceivable public purpose. So they're using somewhat rational basis here. Um, and you're reducing the oligarch of land that's clearly within the state's police powers. So, you know, there, I think Justice O'Connor is acknowledging that there's kind of a special situation in Hawaii. There really isn't where, you know, you have just a few people own all the land. Now, that's not to say there, there, there isn't where you have some really large, um, you know, property owners and landowners in some places. But the fact that you it goes to private individuals does not make it um, constitutionally suspect. Now, the thing is, if you're if you're able to do that, so let's think about let's think about what the court is allowed in Berman and Midkiff. So basically, we're going to allow you to clean up blight, and we're going to take property from some people, and eventually it's going to go to other people. And Midkiff. We're going to take property to uh, eliminate a housing monopoly. Well, what what about if private individuals are kind of trying to use eminent domain to benefit themselves, but the justification for it is that it's going to lead to higher tax revenue, that that's the public purpose. 
So let's listen to the twice impeached um, former president uh, before he before his uh, 2016 victory, where he really didn't quite know where the Republican base was on eminent domain. Um, this is a segment here from Fox News before they kind of turned in favor of him. I think they were more against him. Let's look at Donald J. Trump. Other candidates, are now, are now Other candidates are now weighing in tonight on Donald Trump's comment on this program last night about eminent domain, the practice of government taking private property with what the government determines is fair compensation. Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen shows us. On the campaign trail, Donald Trump's full-throated defense of eminent domain is again drawing fire. I actually passed both a law and a constitutional amendment that keeps developers like Donald Trump from using the power of eminent domain to take private property away from an owner and give it to another private owner. Likewise, Jeb Bush recently invoked Vera Koking, the New Jersey woman who once refused to sell her modest Atlantic City property to Trump and prevailed in court. One of the candidates for president actually tried to get done, uh, use his, use the this uh, police powers to garner property from a widow that did not want to sell to build a casino. I don't, I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about now. Uh, and it's wrong. Eminent domain cases typically involve the government deciding fair market value for a piece of real estate and forcing the owner to accept it so the property can be seized for some other use. In Kilo versus City of New London in 2005, a mostly liberal majority on the Supreme Court held the practice constitutional, provided it advances a compelling public interest. Was the court overdoing it with that decision? Well, it's sort of not a good one for me to say because I noticed every article written about it said, will Donald Trump take over your home but i happen to agree with it a hundred percent not that i'd want to use it most conservatives regard kilo as a hallmark of government overreach a license to confiscate personal property worthy of king george iii of colonial times trump still disagrees arguing that job creation and other social benefits can outweigh the interests of an individual now just so you understand you're not taking the house you're taking the house and paying much more, no, no, you're paying much more than it's worth. Even if they don't want to sell. Even if they don't want to sell, you're taking a pay. Now, it depends on what. If it's to build another house for somebody else who has more money, absolutely not. Justice Anthony Kennedy, a nominee of Ronald Reagan, joined the majority in Kilo. One of Kennedy's clerks from the following term says eminent domain cuts across, not straight down ideological lines. I think it's not necessarily incompatible with conservatism to say uh, one is in favor of states and cities having relatively wide leeway uh, to use eminent domain powers for what they determine to be in the public use. Eminent domain is one of numerous issues on which Donald Trump diverges from conservative orthodoxy. His call for higher taxes on hedge fund managers is another. But so far, such heresies don't seem to be hurting him in the polls with GOP primary voters. Brett? James, thank you. And you can see the full discussion with Donald Trump about eminent domain on my blog, The Daily Brett. Either go through the special report homepage or get there by going to thedailybrett.com. Other candidates are... So I think probably one of the things that you might realize about Donald Trump is, you know, he's he, he's not an avid reader unless it's kind of more involving him. Um, so and the other thing is, is that, you know, he only recently became a Republican, um, you know, so I think he didn't quite know what the blowback would be on that. So now we're going to go to. The city of New London, Connecticut. So it's a port town. It's along the Long Island Sound. There, it had been in big decline for decades. Like a lot of like a lot of old northeastern, um, you know, manufacturing cities. So the city had a re economic revitalization um, in mind to go against it. So Pfizer. Uh, the folks that have given us both a vaccine and Viagra um, plan to build, they, they wanted to build a $300 million research facility with a lot of stuff. Here's the thing, they would need to, uh, it would take the place of 115 privately owned pieces of land. So some owners wouldn't want to sell, 
typically one lived on the waterfront. So this was uh, um, the, key, the kilos. Their property was in good condition. The only problem she had was that she just happened to be unlucky enough to live in the place that um, they wanted to live, they wanted to be in. So the Connecticut Supreme Court ruled in favor of the city when it was appealed. So the question is, was this a public use under the Fifth Amendment? So let's keep in mind what's going on here. They're going to condemn and take 115 privately owned pieces of land, many of them with homes on them or businesses. Um, you just start thinking, um, you know, how big uh, an area with 115 homes and uh, homes and businesses are. That's a pretty decent size, uh, you know, chunk of territory. And what you're going to do, they are going to see their houses torn down, demolished, and you're going to build a new Pfizer facility. That Pfizer is going to get the property. So what New London is going to get out of it, though, what are they going to get out of it? Well, higher tax revenue. Let's look at this clip here about, um, it's not the best quality, but it gives a little bit more on the background of the case. It also kind of gives away what the outcome is, too. Now let's take a look at the Suzette Kilo case. This case made it all the way to the Supreme Court in 2005. It sparked a huge debate about the importance of property rights. The case involves homeowner Suzette Kilo and her neighbors versus the city of New London, Connecticut. When I first came here with the realtor, I walked in the front door. It was like I had been here all my life. It was just an overwhelming feeling when I walked in this place. In 1998, the city condemned 115 properties in order to build a private health club and office buildings to support the development of a local pharmaceutical plant. Fifteen property owners did not want to sell, so the city used eminent domain to seize their properties. There were, if I could count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There were nine houses spanning this street here. Everybody knew everybody. If you went to work, the neighbors watched your kids. And that's the way it was. In the spring of 1998, the city of New London came out with a municipal development plan that said that the uh, homes in the Fort Trumbull neighborhood would be taken by eminent domain. They thought that they could place something here that would bring more taxes to the city. It was here at the Penny Candy Store. Yeah, and the grinder shop. Yeah, this was the Chevalier's uh, deli. When this first started, there were 90 properties in this neighborhood. The first ones were sold, the absentee landlords. And then after that, they went after the elderly. It was the day before Thanksgiving that they came to my house uh, with the sheriff, and they handed my mom the uh, condemnation papers, basically condemning the property. And this here is where the Pascolinis live. Mrs. Pascolini was 100 years old when they made her leave last summer. 100 years old. And after that, they came after us. We bought billboards. We wrote letters to the editor, put ads in the paper. We went door to door. We had petitions. We went to Hartford. We met with the historic people. We met with everybody trying to not stop the development, understand. We never wanted to stop it. We just simply wanted to stay. He had an auto body shop. They took that by eminent domain, tore that down. So not only did, did he lose his home, he lost his business as well. We fought for nine long years. And uh, unfortunately, the US Supreme Court ruled against us, which I, I was really shocked. They, they, they basically just stripped everybody's property rights away from them. Eminent domain is supposed to be used for your typical, you know, to build a school, a reservoir, a police department, you know, to widen the roads, but not for economic development. Now they're saying they, they could take your property if someone could generate more property taxes than you. Is that right? Wherever we go, we would be fortunate to uh, We would be fortunate to ever find people like the people that were here in our lives again. Surely good people. With the whole country watching, 
the Supreme Court made a very controversial decision. In a 5-4 to four split decision, the court upheld New London's right to use eminent domain. Justice John Paul Stevens wrote the decision. In it, he wrote, The city has carefully formulated an economic development plan that it believes will provide appreciable benefits to the community, including, but by no means limited to, new jobs and increased tax revenue. Because that plan unquestionably serves a public purpose, the takings challenged here satisfy the public use requirement of the Fifth Amendment. But four out of the nine judges disagreed. They said that if eminent domain can be used for any public purpose, then all property is at risk, especially property owned by poor people without political influence. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is one of the judges who disagreed with the decision. She wrote, Under the banner of economic development, all private property is now vulnerable to being taken and transferred to another private owner, so long as it might be upgraded. Nothing is to prevent the state from replacing any Motel 6 with a Ritz-Carlton, any home with a shopping mall, or any farm with a factory. So those are some of the arguments. So I think that was a, um, you know, it, it was it was produced by somebody that, uh, not very old, but uh, I think they uh, had some good stuff in there. Um, you know, there's a little bit of New London. You can see this along the bay there. Um, so, I mean, just think about that. So, I, I'll be honest with you. I think this case, um, I'm surprised, um, I would be surprised if, um, if the new conservative 6-3 majority doesn't find some way to take up a case to overrule this one. I'm actually kind of surprised that uh, they haven't found one since Kavanaugh came on the bench, frankly. But the arguments here for Kilo, the use of eminent domain for solely private business development is not a public use. So just saying that increased taxes is a slippery slope to just basically take people's land, take people's houses, take people's businesses, and give them to somebody else with the idea that you're going to make more tax revenue and money, this is not good. So economic de development does not justify this. There have to be some limits that's going to target the poor and lower class people. It's going to target people that can't fight back. So, you know, I just always think about this. The, a lot of the folks that tend to lose out in these eminent domain cases, how, how often do you think it's probably the very wealthy areas? that lose out, the very um, upper class homes. No, of course not. Um, you know, it's people that um, basically don't have as much political power and don't, don't, don't think they can fight back. Now, the city of New London says this was a combat the fact that the city of New London was going downhill for a while. And that one of the things that we had seen in Berman and we had seen in Midkiff was a lot of deference by the courts. It's basically saying that, you know, kind of, if you will, you know, if uh, if the court, if the if the legislative body or city or whomever says that it's a public purpose, we'll 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 go along with there. So they said the primary purpose of the takings clause is just fair compensation. So if you don't like this, you should look in the democratic process. You know, have Connecticut passed some laws that said you can't do this would be a way. So in a five to four ruling with Kennedy concurring, so Justice O'Connor, this is one of those cases where Justice O'Connor, um, we're going to find out when we get to our next chapter, often was very, um, very mindful of public opinion. So she didn't want the, she, she was somebody that really didn't want the court to get too far out of the mainstream of public opinion. So, you know, she kind of, uh, kind of Bush v. Gore, there's some issues there. Later she kind of, she doesn't say she regrets her vote, but she sort of does. But Kennedy provides the fifth vote, where Justice Stevens writes this decision. And he says, hey, this is different than other cases. But you know what we're going to do? And then in Berman and in Midkiff, we had a lot of deference. We had a lot of deference to the legislature. We're going to continue to do that. And, you know, he said that, uh, you know, they were saying that in this area, the Fort Trumbull area, 
Um, they wanted to remove blight, economic re revitalization, rejuvenation, and they created a plan to do this. It was that was not the only thing that you were going to get new jobs, you were going to get increased tax revenue, and that um, it will you know you're going to have a variety of purposes in this and that it will be to the benefit of the people there. And again, this is one that kind of, uh, some of the language that's used here by Justice Stevens is some of the language that was used a little bit by Justice Douglas, in that, you know, you can't do it in a piecemeal fashion. You have to do it in kind of a, a, a comprehensive plan. So, you know, basically saying that, uh, you know, um, rejecting, rejecting what... Um, Suzette Kilo and others were, were trying to get the court to rule um, is saying that you know we, we don't want to have so so they want to have a bright line rule they're not going to say that we say that we're going to um, so there there is no basis from for exempting us from public use it's up to the states kind of it's it's an interesting thing i always think when uh, when some of the justices always um you know if there are areas where they kind of like uh, certain areas of law they're saying oh leave it to states you know sometimes you have conservatives say leaning into states sometimes you have the liberal justice saying leave it to states um but they say you know let them let them take care of it you know we're not going to step in and say no um he also doesn't see it as an a to b transaction um I think here. Um, now, Justice Kennedy again provides the um, vote here. It's a concurring opinion, so he he joins in what Stephen says. He just wants to kind of add his two. So, uh, if you just see where it only says concurring, I always say that's what I call my two cents. Um, you know, kind of as a way of putting it, that um, that. You know, you're you're just trying to uh, kind of say, well, you know, I agree with you, but uh, I want to add a few things. I want to maybe explain, uh, you know, a few observations. So Kennedy sees it as part of a comprehensive plan. He said, though, you know, um, even though we're applying rational basis, um, if if you were just giving it from party A to party B if it was not part of a comprehensive plan, that he thinks it would be just a little bit more suspicious. Now, Justice O'Connor here writes the lead dissent joined by Chief Justice Rehnquist, Justice Scalia, and Thomas. Um, she clearly thinks that this goes too far. So what she says here is that, um, I kind of like what she has here, um, quoting Justice Chase, an act of the legislature for I cannot call it a law. Contrary to the great principles of the social compact cannot be considered a rightful exercise of legislative authority. A few instances will suffice to explain what I mean. A law that takes property from A and gives it to B, it is against all reason and justice for a people to entrust the legislature with such powers, and therefore it cannot be presumed that they have done it. So, she's not happy with this. She and remember, remember, Justice O'Connor. I think this is one of the reasons, probably, that Just Chief Justice Rehnquist assigned the dissent to her. Remember, she was the one that wrote the unanimous decision in Midkiff. So, you know what she's saying there. You know, if if you try to compare and contrast this with Berman and Midkiff, you know, Midkiff was something that was that was, you know, just a really specific thing. In 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 Berman, you know, Congress had made this decision here um, that that they had to do this for health and safety. You know, but here, you know, the the people, the petitioners in this case, Set Kilo and Wilhelmina Derry, their houses, their houses were in good shape. There was no problem. There was no problem at all with them. They were nice. They didn't want to leave. There was no blight on their houses. That really here, 
No. No, 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 no. But this is really just that um, the city of New London thinks that they can get more tax revenue out of doing this. So, you know, remember, kind of the, the deal in Berman wasn't talking necessarily about tax revenue, it was about blight. This was more about economic development. Um, so again, more of a transfer from party A to party B. And she says that, you know, she makes the slippery slope argument saying that she thinks that there could be problems that, uh, you know, if, if government knows that they can basically take property from person A and, and give it to somebody else, they're going to do it more. And she's right. But also Justice Stevens is right, too. And I'll get to that there kind of in my closing remarks at the end of the chapter. Now, Justice Thomas has a dissent. So, you know, Justice Thomas is uh, um, kind of a little bit of an iconoclast, if you will. Um, you know, a lot of sometimes, uh, you know, he has a concurring opinion or a dissenting opinion. Um, sometimes that goes a lot further than other folks. But he would revisit the entire line of public use cases. So he's basically saying here that, uh, you know, I don't accept kind of uh, going along with Midkiff and Berman. I want to get rid of that too. I think we ought to look at that. So you can see there on page um, 651, where they talk kind of about what eventually happens with all of this is that the facility opens and then it closes a few years later. And, uh, you know, one of the things is, is that um, it, uh, <laughs> it moves, it moves just across to another town. So, um, you know, um, was it all worth it? That's one thing to say. Some more recent cases. So I put this, I found this, this is from Scotus Bog. They, they have a, a sketch artist. Remember, there are no cameras in the courtroom. So they often uh, put together a sketch of uh, putting what uh, the justices uh, walking around in a cow pasture. <laughs> so you can see that some of them look happier to be there than others. Um, you can see that, uh, you know, it seems like Justice uh, um, and Justice uh, Sotomayor and um, I think that I can't tell who that one person is. Um, she looks really happy, but um, Justice Kagan looks pretty happy there too. Um, you know, Justice Roberts not as much, um, but there seems to be um, tension on both sides of the issue. So, kind of where you have it politically is that conservative groups tend to support property rights vis-a-vis -vis the government, but they also have pro-business tendencies. Now, in Nick versus Township of Scott in 2019, one of the things that you see is this. Court overrules Williamson County Planning, Regional Planning Commission versus Hamilton Bank. So a person with a takings claim need not bring the case first into state court before proceeding to federal court, essentially making it easier to bring a case. So a 7-2 decision, this was written by Justice Thomas with Sotomayor and Kagan dissenting, held that federal law that prohibited federal agencies from uh, authorizing right-of-ways through federal lands in the park system. So they said that it was not really a land. So this is one of those things where I'm going to show you a clip here after I quit talking on this, is that it seems like um, whenever you're talking about pipelines, which um, can have some really negative effects coming through your property, um, the conservative majority is much more likely to support those saying that they're public uses, while the more liberal justices tend to disagree. So, you know, you need to move um, things through pipelines. But let's take a look here at uh, what some people that objected have to say. The Gerhardt, the Gerhardt family moved to this plot of land in central Pennsylvania 30 years ago. Ellen Gerhardt said she and her husband wanted to keep the land they bought intact 
so they signed up with a state program to preserve the forest. You know, it was almost like our own park, our own little environment, and you got to know the trees, you got to know the landscape. But in 2015, they got a call from a pipeline company, Sunoco Logistics. He said he'd like to come out and talk to us. That, um, Sunoco Logistics was interested in putting in a pipeline. It would run under the road um, in front of us and under part of our pond. He told her the company's offer was generous, but the Gerhards said no. The, the damage that they were proposing to do to the property, um, the the damage to the, well, the trees that they would have to cut down, you can't pay for that. And the moment we said no, they immediately kicked into eminent domain. A local judge sided with Sunoco, saying the company was a public utility and thus had the right of eminent domain. And a few months later, a chainsaw crew showed up on their property. Elise Gerhardt, who'd grown up on the property, protested the clearing by sitting in a tree stand on the right-of-way for days. Meanwhile, a group of local activists came to protest. You guys are not allowed off the right away. Five people were arrested, including Ellen and Elise Gerhardt. But in the end, the trees came down and Sunoco had its pipeline route. The company would not agree to an interview, but in an emailed statement, Sunoco said it only used eminent domain as a last resort. Eminent domain has been used for building highways, utility lines, and parks in the U.S., but it's also used in some states, like Pennsylvania and Ohio, to build oil and gas pipelines. With the recent boom in natural gas in Pennsylvania, companies are spending billions of dollars on new pipelines, and increasingly, they're using eminent domain to take land from owners, like the Gerhards, who don't want pipelines on their land. And you can see why it's, it's controversial. Grant McIntyre is an environmental lawyer who used to work for the EPA. More than 100 landowners have sued Sunoco to protest the company's use of eminent domain in Pennsylvania. So far, the company has mainly come out ahead in court. McIntyre says many opposed to the pipelines argue eminent domain is supposed to benefit the public, not a private company like Sunoco. There is a school of thought a lot of people think that the fair market value that governments or authorities using eminent domain are required to pay may not actually be fair market value. I think in the case of pipelines and, and kind of rural property that they may go through, you may not have a high price per acre on forested land in Pennsylvania. But if it's someone's homestead, a, a place where their families live for generations, that price per acre doesn't reflect their, the, the real value to, the, to that person. McIntyre said a recent Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision that found eminent domain use for natural gas storage unconstitutional could make it harder for energy companies to use eminent domain for pipelines. The Gerhards turned down $100,000 for the pipeline to go through their property. Ellen Gerhardt says she never even considered it. People have, have said I've, uh, to me, well, you know, but you, you're not doing anything with that land. It's just sitting there. You know, you're not farming it, you're not building on it, you're not timbering it, you're not doing anything with it. And that's the point. It's still hard to go and see those trees just lying there and knowing that, you know, you can't glue them back together, you can't put them back up, they're gone. Now, I think that one of the things that we have to keep in mind, remember we were talking about pipelines, is that, um, you know, is a pipeline essentially a public utility? So, you know, public utilities um, are often privately owned, but very regulated. Um, so the one thing that I think you'd have to say is that um, given more, um, let's say if you're going to take more of the conservative, um, well, politically, um, looking at that saying is that, um, you know, it's to the public's benefit to have, let's say, natural gas transported in areas because it's going to mean maybe lower prices and such. But on the other hand, um, you know, do you want the stuff running through your property? So, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, positives and negatives. But the one thing is, is that if you aren't going to allow different pipelines, if you're going to allow it in a piecemeal nature, essentially you're going to make it where one person can hold up a lot of progress. So I think that those are some ways of looking at that. So I think that some of it 
is kind of wrapped up in some different, um, you know, issues with environmentalism too. So let's move to the last part, and that's just compensation. So what is the fair value when there's a valid taking? So now we're going to assume that there is a taking. It was for a public purpose. Now, how much money do you get? So remember one of the things that Justice Douglas had talked about in Berman versus Parker was that the primary purpose of the, of the Fifth Amendment was to compensate you, that the government can't take it for nothing like they could in some countries. So, you know, you just think about this, um, you know, in, in some more totalitarian societies, um, if the government wants your house, they're just going to take it. You know, let's tell you to uh, go somewhere else. If you, if you say some, if you object, um, you know, bad things could happen to you. Now, one of the things is is that um, you know, just think about this. If you've ever um, you know tried to negotiate a price of something, you just have to remember is that the person wanting to sell something thinks it's probably worth more than somebody wanting to buy something. So, you know, if you've tried to buy a car or a house, you know, a lot of times you meet somewhere in the middle. Now, there are kind of um, external factors that somebody that is an appraiser can't come and um, evaluate that well. So let's say, you know, if you have something, that, a house that's been in the family for years, a lot of times people call it the homestead or something, you know, or your land's been in the family for a lot of years. There's a certain personal and sentimental attachment to that that you can't necessarily put a, put a value on. Or the fact that it's your home. You know, I mean, you just think about this. Um, think about this. If, 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 if you're somebody that lived... Um, you know, in your home, your whole life. You know, your your parents are there. Maybe maybe now it's your grand grand or whatever. You know, you have those little things. You know, you know, like like maybe there's a place in your house where where each year for for your kid's birthday, you know, you you had a little you had a little mark or notch that uh, that showed how tall they were. Or I mean, just a lot of things. I mean, the thing is, you get you probably get used to where you live too. You know, maybe kind of really like where you live. So, some may also think that um, you know, their things are um, so much that the government can't afford to pay for what the owners want. So, kind of the market value versus personal attachment. You know, so kind of in the um, in a capitalist society and. Uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily have regulations. If, if let's say, someone is, char is wanting to charge or wants too much for something, the way that that would generally work is that um, nobody pays it for that. Or, or maybe it's a large amount of stuff, maybe just a few people pay for it, and you're not making money. So you eventually have to lower the price. So, I mean, think about this. Think, think about if you go to a yard sale or a garage sale, um, or if you're on eBay, or a lot of different things. Um, you know, I mean, even think about it, even think about it if you go to Target or Wegmans or Tops or wherever, is this. Um, you know, there are some people that don't have to necessarily look at how much something costs. If they want it, they buy it. Other people, aka most of us, they're probably going to look at the price and they're going to say, it's too much. And they'll you know, put it back or they won't buy it. Um, you know, or, you know, if it's if it's like a yard sale or something, you know, maybe you get towards the end of the yard sale or something, and, you know, lost, some stuff hasn't sold, and you're kind of like, oh, well, this says, uh, this says $50, uh, would you take 20 person may say yes or no. But here, the thing is, is that we've already required a forced sale. The sale is going to, it's not even a sale. It's what we call a condemnation. 
So whenever you have eminent domain, what happens is, is that if the two parties can't um, mutually agree on a price for whatever, that government entity is going to file a lawsuit um, either in state or federal court. It depends on who the parties are, who the, who the parties are. It's going to say, um, we have eminent domain powers. This is a public purpose. Um, we're taking the property. And now we're going to look at how much is the fair market value. Now, there's a question of fact. In some places, this could go to a jury. So I know a case where there was a former judge in the county that I'm from whenever um, the state was coming through and just widening a road a little bit. So they really just wanted a little, they didn't want hardly anything. Um, they just wanted a little bit of extra um, uh, right away along the road. And um, I think he thought that he was a judge. He could, he could extort them for it. Um, it turned out that um, the jury in the case disliked him so much that the amount that the jury awarded was actually less than the appraised value. So, you know, it just goes to show you, you know, don't be an asshole um, out there. Um, you know, so, you know, again, it was something where they weren't even going to take, they weren't going to take anything. I mean, literally, um, I know where the person lives. I don't even notice that they really did any, they really did a whole lot um, at all. But I'm kind of going to some of our cases. In Kimball Laundry versus the United States, normally the market value is what a willing buyer would pay in cash to a willing seller. Now, the cash part is a little bit interesting because, you know, a lot of times people don't necessarily have cash. Let's say if you want to buy a house, maybe you have to finance it. Um, but um, the way that um, that is generally um, taken care of today is that an appraiser. You would find somebody that um, would be a non-interested appraiser. So some of you may have dealt with appraisers um, in your lives or maybe your parents or things. So, for instance, um, you know, you know, often maybe if you're buying a house, maybe you'll have somebody appraise it to see, oh, okay, you know, they want X number of dollars. Is it actually worth that much? Or maybe, you know, you there are a lot of reasons. Maybe maybe your property tax, maybe they assess your property way too much. Um, and you're like, uh, I don't think it's worth that much. I don't want to pay these property taxes. Um, you know, and, and in some cases also, maybe you need an appraisal. Let's say if you're going to refinance. Um, let's say if your home is worth more because maybe you want a home equity loan or some different things. So in United States versus Miller, they said the future increase in value need not be compensated to the taking. Um, of course kind of follows on this, but what about the fair market value for the property versus acquiring comparable property? So kind of a pre taking. So do we have to restore you to the same position? Um, that may not be fair market value. So let's say, you know, one of the things is, is, you, you know, just think about this, you know, maybe your house is not in that great a shape, but it's fine for you. I mean, maybe there are some things where, you know, there are some repairs that need to be done, but not anything major. I mean, it's not like your house is falling down or anything by any measure, but if you buy, but you know, maybe it's an older home. Maybe you want to try to buy something new. Um, the difference between you moving from your house A to finding house B, you may not be able to get the comparable um, the comparable place for the price that you got from the government. And remember, this is a this is a very 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 big power that governments have. Um, you know. You just think about this. The, the only greater powers that the government, I think, really has is um, is the ability to take, let's say, your freedom or your life through the criminal justice system or probably the ability to conscript you through the draft. So um, the case that we have here is that our lead case that the authors have, United States versus 546.54 acres of land in 1979. 
So you're probably wondering, why do I have pictures of me in uh, my Taylor Swift hat um, um, and uh, kind of looking at different places there? Because this involves the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, which at some point I think may become um, a new national park. It'd be nice. So, um, you know, I got my PhD at Binghamton, which is not that far from it. So, so the one thing is, if some of you that, um, depending on where you live, um, if you've driven, if you've driven down New York City, one of the one, there are multiple ways to go there from here, but of course, one is that eventually you end up in Binghamton, and you know, you take 81 down to Scranton. And, you know, you get on some other highways, eventually get on 80. And then, you know, the thing is, you know, you get in that area where um, it really dips down a lot and uh, gets really windy. But, you know, you kind of have what some people call the Grand Canyon of the uh, Northeast. So the Delaware Water Gap. So where the Delaware River cuts this big, um, big um, um, area of uh, land. So it's actually a national recreation area. There, there, I mean, it's a lot of areas. So there's a lot of uh, you know, waterfalls that are a little bit further away from necessarily the Delaware um, River. And you have the Delaware Water Gap, which is very beautiful to see. So what you have here is that the Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod of the Lutheran Church of America. They had three nonprofit summer camps. Um, in Monroe County. So Monroe County um, is the county where you would cross through um, on I-80 into New Jersey if you were if you were taking that. So the government wanted to develop the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area more. So the federal government used its power of eminent domain to acquire three camps. So one of the things is you're probably noticing is that, that um, when you're dealing with the federal government, or if you're, let's say, dealing with state government, um, the bigger the state and the federal government, the more power they have over you. So, you know, when you get a letter from, you know, the U.S. government that says, we're taking your property, here's what we're going to offer you. You know, not a lot of people necessarily can fight the federal government. So they have a lot of resources. State governments have a lot of resources. The bigger the city and the county that you have, have a lot of resources. Um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, there might not be a lot of negotiation. They're kind of like, this is how much it's worth. This is what we're giving you. Get out. So they agreed. So there was an agreement that this was a taking and that this was a public use. They disagreed on the amount and it was a big disagreement. And it was not a disagreement of like, um, you know, we think it's worth half a million. We, One side thinks it's worth half a million. One side thinks it's worth a million. This was the federal government said it was worth $485,400. The church says $5.8 million. So this is like 12 times as much. So you're probably thinking, well, why was there such a big amount of disagreement? The reason is, is that the church said that there were no comparing comparable camping facilities available. So what they would have to do was to build new ones. So as you can kind of guess, those facilities they had were built a long time ago. I don't know how long ago, but a long time ago. Back when there were not really a lot of regulations, a lot of... Uh, a lot of other things, um, new rules and things. So basically they were grandfathered in. So, you know, it was kind of like the state of Pennsylvania said, oh, you, you're providing a very nice service. You know, we don't we don't have to make you do all these things. Um, so, you know, when they, they started looking around, they're like, oh, we can't buy anything. We can't buy any new places for $485,400. Um, so we're gonna have to build a new facility. We're gonna have to build new facilities. We're gonna have to find land. So the church lost at the federal district court level, but the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit of Philadelphia disagreed. Said it had an important community function. And therefore, the costs of the building in the new camps would require compensation. So just to let you know that picture there, I believe was from 2015. So um, my face 
is not as fat anymore. For those of you that have seen me in person or may see me. So the arguments for the United States is that just compensation is only based on the fair market value of the property only. It does not require the building of new facilities. So the church disagrees, of course. So what they said is that when you when public facilities are taken when public facilities are taken, the old law, the Fifth Amendment requires compensation for the construction of new facilities. So we should also extend this and apply it to private ones. So because the fair market value would not cover the new construction, this would end the church's camping programs. So again, you know, keep I mean keep in mind, I mean this offer this offers young children the chances to engage in sports, nature activities, arts and crafts. Something that they might not be able to ever something that they may lose if these are eliminated. So I think they're playing the card of saying, you know, you're taking away something from people and you shouldn't be doing it. It's a unanimous decision by Justice Marshall. So one of the things you might remember is that, uh, you know, Justice Marshall had a case where um, kind of uh, um, what we might think, um, um, well, let me take that back, on, on takings clauses um, before. So it was a unanimous decision. Justice Powell did not participate. I don't know why. Um, I don't think that he's from, he's from Richmond, Virginia, so I don't think he probably went there, and he was never a judge on the Third Circuit. Um, you know, he never, and he only he retired in 1987, so you know, it's not like he was getting ready to retire, but I don't know. Again, I wanted to figure out why it was 8-0 to zero instead of 9-0. to zero. Those are one of those little things that sometimes kind of bother me. So... The court has long developed the concept that just compensation would be based off the fair market value. So what Marshall here says for the, for the unanimous court is that it strikes a, necess, a proper balance between the needs of the parties. So the needs of the parties are that uh, you know the government wants to obtain new property for some type of a public use. And on the other side, that the person who's having the property taken from them um, gets just compensation. Now, one of the things that Justice Marshall acknowledged is that the market for these type of camps was very small, very small. But they were still able to figure out what the, what the fair market value was. So it's common that Justice Marshall says is that the fair market value may not cover the cost to build something new. You know, one of the things that he brings up is, is that if you have to build something new, versus build something old. Just think about this. An old house, is it worth the same as a new house? No. I mean, I mean, if, if you let's, now let me take that, let me just expand on that. What I'm saying here is that we're talking about a house, let, let's say if we're talking about houses. Let's say if we're talking about a similarly compared house. You know, let's say that it's a three bedroom house with two bathrooms, um, you know, has a living room, um, you know, a two, two, two car garage um, on one acre of land. Um, it's in a similar neighborhood. And one house was, was just built in 2020 versus one that was built in 1960. The one thing is houses, houses are like cars and people and cats or dogs or pets. The, the longer we're around, the more problems that can happen. So, you know, you just think about it. Um, you know, at some point your air conditioner goes out, you know, at some point you need a new roof. So maybe you've had a new roof. Maybe you've had all these things. Um, more recent bill houses have more insulation. So there are a lot of different things that you can say that, you know, your your 1960 house that is of comparable uh, description is not going to be worth the same as the 2020 house. It's not going to, the 2020 house probably isn't, uh, you know, is it comparable to the 2022 house? I don't know, maybe, but 
the difference in time. So the court will not apply something different for a nonprofit organization as it would to a private individual business. So, so that's where they were trying to get. They, that's where they. That's one of the hooks they were trying to get. So they ne not necessarily were trying to say, okay, you know, let's lump all of this together. You know, like if they if they take my 1960 house, I need to be able to be able to build a 2020 house of similar things. Um, they're trying to say, oh, we're a nonprofit organization, so extend that stuff that we have on, um, you know, public property to this. So it says it's not relevant that the church provides for the public welfare. The government has no no obligation to replace the camps, no matter whether they have a lot of social worth. So I think it can, they're very dismiss. The, the court is very dismissive. So. One of the things that um, you know Justice Marshall eventually kind of gets to is that to say that if you award replacement costs, it could lead to a windfall. So what do I mean there? Is that if uh, you know let let's let's say you have a three hundred thousand dollar home um, and the government takes it and you build a uh, um, basically the same specs and everything, um, same neighborhood build a new one, is it probably worth $300,000? Probably not. Maybe it's worth $400,000 or $500,000. So, you know, you're not going to get that. The guiding principle of just compensation is the person made whole and nothing more. The principle does not change because the owner provides a valuable service. The church is only able to recover the fair market value and not anything else that the church loses. Justice White joins completely in the opinion, fully in the Marshall opinion. But he adds something. He adds one of those concurring opinions that is like inviting, inviting a challenge, basically saying, maybe some of our old precedent we might uh, uh, disregard if you bring a new case. So having the new facilities will be of some benefit to the entity whose property were taken. So, but he would go further saying that uh, the part on public property being able to get replacements costs should be able to, uh, should be, should be re-examined. All property should be treated equally. But he says it was not the issue in the case, but we don't have to decide it. But it's kind of one of those things where, where the court is kind of saying, well, um, you know, you don't have to bring it up, but you can. And if you would, I think we're open to it. And then the court would be open to it five years later. In the United States, there's 50 acres of land in an unanimous decision written by Stevens. You have a concurring opinion that's written by Justice O'Connor, joined by Justice Powell. So the federal government acquired, acquired some land in Duncanville, Texas, which is uh, in Dallas County. So it's kind of a smaller town within Dallas County, kind of to a little bit to the southwest of Dallas itself. Um, so it was going to take some property that was used as a landfill for waste management. So the court ruled that the federal government need not pay more than fair market value. They rejected that the government would have to pay for a replacement landfill that would be, let's say, more environmentally conscious. So to wrap up the takings clause. So while just, co just compensation can be easily answered constitutionally, the other two questions not as easy. So, the, again, the thing with just compensation is that it's one that can be answered fairly easily constitutionally lately, but it's more of a question of fact rather than a question of law. So it's a question of, you know, how much is something worth? Different people are going to disagree on how much is something worth. But what is it taking? So you have a lot of groups, especially on the right and conservatives, that want to make imposing regulations more burdensome on the government to do. So make it more expensive for the government to do. So basically saying that, uh, okay, you want to do this? You want to make this regulation? You're going to have to pay people for the people that are impacted on it. And going back to with the public use, local government stepped up their use of eminent domain after Kilo. You know, because local governments, local governments are always saying, you know, we'd like more tax revenue. You know, because often they're, they might not be dealing with that much. Especially especially kind of smaller, medium-sized places. Um, but there was a political backlash. Um, 
there were laws that were passed in states to prevent this. And one of the things that I do predict at some point is that um, the Roberts Court would overrule Kelo. Um, they, you know, as we saw in the Dobbs case, you know, if they can overturn Roe v. Wade, do you think that they would really uh, blink to overturn Kelo, which is not a, not a very popular case? I don't think so. So next time what's going to happen is, is that um, um, you can't see me, but I am actually holding up my Institutional Powers and Constraints book. Um, we are done with that. Now, just to let you know, if you are going to take in the future Political Science 303, which is called Constitutional Law here at UB, um, you can keep this book and use it. So the remaining chapters will will be used. So you can keep that book. So you kind of got a two for there. Um, so we'll move to the right to privacy. So abortion rights, um, but mainly we're going to kind of start with contraception. So Griswold versus Connecticut is our first case. So, like I said, you know, you can keep the book, sell the book, uh, if you like the book, but you can use it for Political Science 303. Um, I just uh, am sorry for those of you that might have taken Political Science 303 before we migrated over to the 11th edition, if you were using the 9th edition, that uh, um, there are a few changes. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, if you use the 9th edition, um, the page numbers are different, but um, you wouldn't have missed much. They don't change that much in these editions, unfortunately. Um, so we're done with that. We're going to move on to kind of the second um, trimester of the course. Notice how I, what I did there. Um, kind of, uh, I, I kind of put it where the course is divided up into three sections. Um, so we finished kind of the first section. So everyone, I hope, is doing well during during our uh, session semester. Um, and be well, and uh, I will see you all virtually next time. Bye-bye.